This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, my name is Tom Whitlow. I'm a faculty member in the horticulture section of SIPS. And today, we're going to be doing some trash talking. Um, <laughs> as many of you may know, the Ford Sustainability Committee started uh, about the first year beginning of classes this past spring. And it was catalyzed by our own faculty colleague, Jane Mount Pleasant, when she realized how much junk there was. And I, I say junk or trash, but how much reusable or recyclable or compostable things we produced at all of our meetings. And it was basically just going into uh, a landfill. So, Jane convened a sustainability committee, and over the past nine months or so, we've been trying to encourage everyone to do things like bring their own utensils to events like this, and bring your own cups to put coffee in, and so forth. Um, the really big challenge that's facing the committee, and I would suggest maybe Cornell as well right now, is upscaling our composting operation. Composting happens, but it's very difficult to make it really efficient, and we've got multiple sources, multiple kinds of stuff, and many of our local composting or smaller scale local composting operations don't accept all of this stuff. So, our composting or our sustainability committee uh, decided that catch everybody at the beginning, close to the beginning of the semester, and talk about waste management with broadly at Cornell, and how it works and how we can make it work better. This is going to be a tag team presentation. Our first presenter is going to be Jane Mount Pleasant, and I, I don't have any cool pictures from fourth grade or anything <laughs> like that for any of these people. but. Um, Rest assured, I think that they will all have their, their own entertaining and elucidating things to, to show us today. So we, we're going to be uh, treated to talks by Jane, by three graduate students, uh, Annika Huber, Isabel Brandstrom, and Juana Munoz. And they're going to be talking about different aspects of ways that I have So, Jane, turn it for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, for that very nice um, introduction. But I do want to say that it's mostly the graduate students that have been doing the lion's share of this work. And I'm really grateful to, to be working with them. Um, we are going to talk about waste management at Cornell. Um, one of the first things is how much waste do we generate? And it is a pretty um, mind-boggling term over 21,000 tons in 2014, and you can see that compost is about 40% of that. The next big thing is our kind of commonly understood recycle and reuse, and over 20% ends up in landfill. But when we think, look at these big numbers, how much is a ton, um, a lot of us have a hard time visualizing it. Well, this is what a ton of landfill waste looks like, at least the volume, right, and the weight, right? So you kind of get an idea of what, you know, 21,000, you know, elephants, that's an awful lot of stuff that we're throwing into the land waste. But let's go back and look a little bit more at our overall waste. Um, a large portion of it is actually compost, and about almost 90% it is plant animal waste, right? Um, animal waste being animal um, waste from our, our farm operations. And plant waste can come from all over campus. Food scraps make up only about 12% um, percent of that. In terms of recycling and reusing, we have close to 3,000 tons. Um, the biggest um, chunk is what we commonly call single stream. This is the stuff that we put in it's the recycled paper and recycled plastic, and that's about 50%. Yard waste also makes up another big um, uh, you know, component. This ends up um, 
being turned into mulch that's uh, used by grounds on, on um, you know, pathways and, and on garden beds. Surprisingly, scrap metal is 9%, electronic scrap 5%, and used furniture about 2%. We have another category, which is over 100 tons. Surprisingly here, <coughs> used oil, whether it's cooking oil or motor and pump oil, right? Used cooking oil, 54%, um, used motor oil, 22%, batteries, 12%, and tires, 12%. So who's in charge of all this? Cornell University's R5 Operations and Waste Management, and we are just delighted this morning to have two representatives of that group here with us. This is Springbok and George Wood. And if you ever want to have wanted to be a groupie, these are folks you want to tail around because they really do great stuff. Um, and we should all know who they are and, and be very um, admiring of them. This is their website. If anything you want to know about waste at Cornell, you can probably find it on this website. So here they are, Spring and George, and they're always thinking about how to do a better job of managing waste at, at Cornell. So where does all of our waste go? Well, the landfill waste, which is a huge amount, over 3,000 tons, Casella, which is a a local company uh, takes it to Seneca Metal Landfill up in Waterloo, New York. And this is a 400 acre um, operation um, that is at the north end of kind of Cuban and Seneca Lakes. We also, um, our compost is done on site, on campus. This is Farm Services, um, does this, and it's a, it's a commercial size operation. We also have an institute, the Cornell Waste Management Institute at Cornell. Um, does research on all aspects of composting, both um, looking at you know commercial stuff, looking how to compost dairy cows and and, um, and dead deer that they find on the on the road. Um, they offer all sorts of services to cities and towns across the country. Maybe I don't know, at least New York State, about how to do a better job of composting. Our single stream recycle goes to the Tompkins County Solid Waste scrap metal, a bunch of different vendors, um, electronic scrap, Sun King in Newport, <coughs> New York, reused furniture, who would have ever thought, 57 tons. Uh, some of it goes into a public auction. At Cornell, we have a used furniture inventory and a Cornell assets trans transfer program where if departments or units, colleges have excess furniture, there's ways to find out if other units or colleges can use it. Um, and so we don't end up taking it to the, um, to the landfill. We also give stuff to community reuse programs and then finally dump and run. This is the program um, that in the spring when students are, are moving out in the, the spring term, um, they can um, collect all of their excess furniture and clothing and appliances and just unbelievable things. It's stored sorted and stored over summer and then in August, the first weekend when um, Cornell students come back, particularly first year students, um, they can then buy these, um, these items um, and, and it avoids um, putting them in, into the landfill. If you're wondering what happens to the cooking oil, it goes to National Oil Recycling in North Rose, New York. They use motor and pump oil to York, Pennsylvania, mattresses. They get reused at University Sleep Products, right? Um, eight tons of wood pellets go to a company in Syracuse. Batteries, seven tons to a national outfit called NLR. Tires, Casella distributes them to companies to make into athletic turf. Turf and, and bedding mulch. That's not much, but mulch, right? There were new compost rules that started August 15th. And the new rules on the Cornell campus say food scraps only. The only thing you can put in our yellow compost um, bins are food scraps. And you might say, why? So many other things will compost, right? Well, the problem um, is contamination. And our dining halls and um, everybody who tries to compost on the large scale 
has a problem with uh, people who throw things in there um, that shouldn't be composted. Um, so for example, what we're now saying is things like the compostable cups and even things like paper cups that say container and paper plates that you might think would be compostable and all that wonderful compostable plasticware, you know, it cannot go into compost. Why? Because it doesn't really compost. Um, and this is from uh, Seneca Compost and what you see is just tons of stuff that's in their compost that doesn't break down, right? So what's the solution to this? Well, if we keep doing it, uh, Seneca Compost and other companies that do compost, they just refuse to take it. So Cornell Dining is stuck with the compostable materials. What to do with it, right? So the solution is Cornell is no longer accepting um, things like the, the silverware. Don't put it. But Jane, the, the composting facility out on Stevens Road doesn't take dining hall compost. That is that right? That's the term, right? They do. So why? So, but this is Cayuga compost. It's the same. It doesn't matter. Nobody takes it because it doesn't compost. Right? So if you do food scraps at home and it goes through to um, Tompkins County food scraps, which goes to Cayuga compost, they won't take it either. All right, so we know how Cornell does it, and now the question is, well, why should we really care about this, and how do we um, compare with other countries and other parts of the U.S.? And I'm turning it over to my colleague, Annika. So in the next few minutes, I would like to talk how, um, you know, way, the waste management or the numbers we just heard about compared to the rest of the U.S. And I would like start with this table, and this table summarizes um, the proportion of waste which is probably disposed. And it shows the numbers from all of America in 2012. And I would like to point out two numbers. The first number, um, plastics we produce on an everyday basis, and you can see here that only 8.8% are actually probably disposed. This means the other 92% um, um, end on landfills. And the same is here with the food scraps. Only 4.8% of all food scraps get, ends up in composting facilities. This means 95% of all organics end up either in a landfill or get burned in an incinerator. And I was very uh, surprised and shocked by these low numbers because it would be very easy for us just to compost properly. <coughs> so how would this, just a reminder, relate to Cornell? So <coughs> in Cornell, 79% of <coughs> all our waste was either in recycling or composting. And in comparison to Cornell, the United States only 35% of our waste gets probably uh, disposed. But why does it matter if organics end up on a landfill or a composting facility? And the issue is when we, or you know the process in a composting facility is if you put organics, uh, displaced organics in um, composting facilities, then they get decomposed under aerobic conditions and CO2 is released. And this CO2 is part of the natu natural short-term carbon cycle. However, if you put it on the, on, in a landfill, the conditions there are anaerobic. And this means next to CO2, also methane and nitrous oxide are produced. And these are very bad greenhouse gas gases. And how bad they actually are, you can see here in this table. Um, it shows the global warming uh, potential of greenhouse gases. And under global warming potential, we understand potential of a given greenhouse gas in comparison to um, carbon dioxide. And methane, it, methane is 25% worse, and 25 times um, worse, and nitrous oxide actually around 300 times. And this actually results then in this chart. These are US greenhouse gas emissions from waste management schemes in the US from 1990 to 2014. 
And the um, y-axis shows um, the emissions in million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. And you can see that the majority of uh, greenhouse gases comes from landfill. That's because it's anaerobic. It's followed by wastewater treatment by around uh, 15 to 20%. And it's, uh, it's so much because it's also happening under anaerobic conditions. And then the composting actually has a tiny fraction of it. So when we, and when we now just look at the methane production uh, emissions from landfills, it's 22%, uh, 20.2%, and that's the third large source of methane emitted in the US. Um, yeah, now I give you all the numbers, but when we actually look at the percentage of the greenhouse gases which are emitted from the waste streams in comparison to all the emitted greenhouse gases, it only makes 2.5%. So this number is tiny, and probably you think, why should we care? It's such a tiny percentage. However, however every penny counts, and actually these 2.5% are very easy to be reduced, and every one of us can contribute by yeah, recycling and composting to make it happen. So and that, I hand over to Mana. Okay. So talking specifically about Cornell, we know that 75% of the waste is not taken to the landfill, but keep in mind that this includes manure and uh, um, pruning waste, and obviously nobody sends that to the landfill. So, we can do a lot better than that still. And one of the things that we want you to take with you today is that recycling is great for many reasons, but it is not going to solve our problems. So granted, recycling can reduce waste sent to landfills and incinerators, sorry. Um, for many products, it results in a lot less energy needed to produce new things in comparison to using raw or virgin materials. It creates jobs. We all love to create that. And it can also be, the recycled products can also be sold to other end users for cheaper than the raw material. It, um, depending on the material that we're talking about, recycling can save energy when processed into new material, into new things from recycled materials. So you can see here, uh, materials like glass, not a huge energy save, but aluminum cans and the copper wire are way more significant. If we're talking about reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, we can see things like copper wire, steel cans, and certain plastics can really help in reducing the um, greenhouse gas emissions associated with making things from new plastics. However, things like office paper, which we do consume a lot of and normally think, oh, we'll just recycle it and it's okay, it actually takes, it produces greenhouse gases to recycle paper. So that's something that we need to start thinking about. <coughs> And then this was the biggest finding for me, which should not have been surprising, but it was really shocking for me to, to read, that recycling is actually really expensive. And if we talk about only money, it costs the city a lot of money to recycle things, usually because it implies transportation, storage, sorting, a lot of labor. And unfortunately, things like cheap oil prices and really expensive labor contributes to it not being very sustainable to recycle. So this comes from a paper, which is actually the only paper that I've found that actually analyzes recycling as a, um, a from an economic standpoint. And what they found was that if society recycles 10% of its waste, and if that 10% of its waste is majority metal, it's actually a good thing. But the more, the higher the proportion of the recycling that happens, the more expensive it is for the city and for society in general to do this recycling. And keep in mind that if we are in certain places like the United States of America, all this recycled product also gets transported to places like China to be processed. So there's a huge cost to recycling that we don't really see and that we need to start thinking about. So, we found this cartoon which we thought was hilarious. Reference to the Titanic, we don't get that from. <laughs> Even though we don't see the trash, it is always there. 
and I want to share with you a story that I thought about this morning. Um, a couple of years ago in my hometown, a tiny little city called uh, Bogota, Colombia, around 7 million people were there, there was a um, political crisis that led to trash not being picked up. And so all of a sudden, these spoiled people that got their trash picked up three times a week were not getting their trash picked up. They would still put it out on the street, but nobody was picking it up. And within two weeks, people started writing about how they never saw their trash and seeing their trash for the first time and smelling it and seeing what comes with it was a really huge lesson to us. And maybe we should start cutting down our trash together. <coughs> so the big takeaway from the seminar we want is for you guys, all of us, to reduce. It's the big, big first R, right? And we should start thinking about it more. And reduce usually means buying less. But then we know it's hard. Sometimes you can't do it. Sometimes you just can't afford to not buy the six pack of peppers at Wegmans that comes in that awful non-recyclable bag. So maybe we should try to reuse. And instead of coming up with new for, uh, plastic baggies, we should try to recycle, reuse the ones we already have. And then finally, we can still optimize recycling. As Annika pointed out, only 8% of the plastic ends up in recycling. So we can definitely do better. And then, of course, if you want to bring reusable plates to your picnics, we totally support that. So there's a lot of stuff happening on campus that we may not see just because it is not in every room with the normal blue recycling bins. But we have plastic bag and film recycling, which you have to go up to the plant science loading dock or to the mail room to find, but they're there. We also have composting. We have battery recycling and electronics recycling, which sometimes you don't see. Like I said, you have to go search for them. So the only two places I know of are Helen Newman and Rice Hall, where you can actually leave your old mouse that doesn't work and your battery charger that broke down. And then there's also really cool initiatives going on, mostly led by students. The Cornell Environmental Collaborative, they go by ECO, is actually this huge group that gathers all the organizations on campus that do environmentally focused activities. And then there's also the Cornell Food Recovery Network, which I did not know about, and I absolutely brilliant. They go to the dining halls, and they repackage the, fruit, the food that's already been prepared, and then distribute it to the food pantries through the Friendship Donation Network. And if you want to go beyond Cornell, there's other stuff that we can all do. So, like we've already probably told you a million times, bring your own cup, cutlery, and plates to seminar and coffee break. And when you start doing it for lunch every day, that'd be great. Um, there's also a great opportunity to teach people. So I had the experience during Apple Fest where I told somebody that his cider cup was not compostable and he was totally heartbroken, but I taught him. Um, we all see it happening around campus all the time. People just don't pay attention and they just toss their bottles or their can in the first bin they come across. And it's just a matter of saying to that person, hey, maybe you should pay attention. There's a recycling bin next door. Um, I found this recently and I thought it was really cool. You can opt out of receiving junk mail and catalogs. You don't have to ask for junk mail and catalogs, but apparently you can tell them that you don't want it, because that makes more sense. So if you go to this website, they take care of all the actual contacting for you. You just enter your address and tell them you don't want it. And then I figured I would throw this in. We can all drive less and walk a little bit more, maybe even bike more. So we've also set up this uh, email account and we're hoping to become a resource for everybody on waste-related things. So if you have any questions, feel free to email us and we'll do our best to respond. Now there's two more things I want to say before we wrap this up. One is we are always looking for new members and volunteers. So if you are interested in getting involved in any way, in any capacity, please let us know. You can either email us, talk to us at the end. I don't think we have a same issue. We do not have a sign. Um, but we're also going to do a little activity. So underneath most chairs, but not all of them, we love a little present. And the idea is you reach under your chair and find your little present, and you have to walk across the room and try to find 
initiatives on campus to reduce the amount of purchasing that we're doing, the amount of packaging we get with all of our, I mean, you get a WB Mason sends me, you put in an order one day, you get four boxes, each with a little item in it the next day. Um, and it just seems like there's ways of reducing, not just doing a better job of, of recycling, and, but how do we re actually reduce Spring. the amount of waste we're getting on campus? Springs. Probably that's spends you 10 do? hours a day thinking exactly yeah, about so, those mm -hmm. questions. So that's what you do, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so there's a few things going on, or there's, there's a few things happening around that. So one is um, the present Sustainable Campus Committee has a procurement team <coughs> um, that is working on Can everybody hear or does she need a microphone? Can you all hear me okay? Well, Geneva, Geneva will hear me. Can you hear me? No, Geneva can't. Hi, Geneva. Hi, Geneva. Yeah. Um, so, so there's a, the President's Sustainable Campus Committee has 10 focus teams um, around sustainable issues. One of those teams is waste, um, but there's also one of those teams is procurement. And so they are focusing very hard on that. So one of the things they had done uh, before W.B. Mason wrote with Staples is, for example, um, you couldn't place an order for less than $50 to try to force departments to group their orders so that they only send the one box. Um, and I will admit that I, I've started getting my feet into the procurement world. Um, I'll be getting deeper over time, but um, but the conversations are happening. So like the, we we rebid the furniture um, bid last year for the first time in like ten years, um, and it was great because we had all these people there talking about it, making sure that our vendors can supply us furniture with legs. Um, so uh, George and I will both tell you that one of our big gripes is all the modular furniture. People think it's Legos, but it's all wall hung and panel hung. And when you start taking it apart, you end up losing a lot of it. So trying to ensure that we have things that are easily movable and can be used in multiple different ways and not just like the one way that they <coughs> um, No question, if you go to a recycling seminar, the number one topic of conversation is procurement. Because what you buy is in turn what you are getting rid of. Um, but a lot of that is getting people to think about it. So Jane knows about our minivan, George's minivan program. We've been working on reducing the size of trash containers um, and having people self-carry them to central points so that people think about what they do. We've done um, building audits 
And what we find is most of that waste is actually people bringing stuff into lunch. So, you know, when you're outside of laboratory spaces and, and things like that, you see a lot of food waste, um, sorry, food related waste. Let me point out a lot of that material is we've done it, we don't see much food, people do eat it, um, but a lot of packaging. So, when these guys are on you about Tupperware, I swear Tupperware is the answer <laughs> for the world. Can you, I mean, one of the things that we know the least about is the plastic that, that you call films, right? Plastic films. Technical word. Technical word. So, one, and we do have plastic films um, that you can dispose of in, in port on first and second floors. The question is, what qualifies as a, a film? So, give us the technical. Film? Okay, yes. Film, yes. film this is really hard. Recyc recycling <laughs> of film of plastics is it has to be soft, it can't be crinkly. Yes, um, I was looking for something that was crinkly in here. Uh, there was a crinkly right here. This is crinkly. It does not go, it has to be landfill, right? So uh, if it crinkles, to the touch. All right? Like cellophane. Cellophane. Crinkly. Crinkly, right? There's literally, this is the best way we've been found, we've looked nationally at how people describe the difference between recyclable film and non-recyclable film, because it's not labeled. So the folks over at um, the county recycling told me that, you know those things that come like cardboard packaging or something that's somewhat soft, clear plastic, mm -hmm. that can't Like the Whiteman's pasta thingies? Yeah, I mean, I Okay. I don't know what you mean. Or even electronics. Clear plastic that doesn't have it's not a one street or seven nine. They told me that can go filmed. Is that right? That's, that's that's single stream. If it hold form, you can put it in single stream recycling. Oh, if they, it's they didn't want it there, they want it in film. Nah. If it's so if it holds form, we go into plastic. It goes into plastic. If it's soft, soft like this, it goes into yes. the film. So bubble wrap can go in here. But like that, that plastic that like kids' toys come in that cuts you when you try to open it. <laughs> that's that's single stream. The only thing, the only plastic that we frequently get that doesn't go in single stream that is hard is styrofoam, and that's landfill. Yes. That is landfill in northeast United States. We don't have anywhere to send it here. Um, I think there's a place in Portland. And then somewhere in England, but um, not sending we're not shipping it there, and it's 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 too fluffy, and it's it, the shipping of it does not counterbalance. So you'll hear about Walmart, for example. I can't believe I'm gonna say this. So Walmart does a really good job with their styrofoam because since they're driving their own trucks, they backhaul it, um, and then they condense it and they ship it overseas to do it. But if you're just shipping for shipping's sake, it's not there's no value on it. So does Cornell recycle packing? Yes. Just I talked about like styrofoam. Oh okay. no, styrofoam. And the truth is, so there's there's actually very limited amount of styrofoam on campus. Um, the the computer equipment is what people most associate with it. And Dell is working very hard, and that's our main contractor for computer supplies. Dell um, is working on cardboard packaging now. Um, so most of the styrofoam that we see on campus is due to laboratory where, I'm sorry to gross anybody out, but like if you're shipping part of a dead thing, you have to keep it cold, sorry, sorry. Um, but in such cases, we don't want to recycle that anyway, um, and they don't have a better option right now. We, we have a question back there. Yes, yeah, so the Cornell Dining Halls, we're doing the disposable uh, trays and utensils. I don't know if they're still doing that. It, yeah. It's because of the drought. Right, right. Oh. It's drought, because of the drought. Drought waste right now. Yeah, so what are your thoughts on that, and how has that affected the loads of waste? Um, it's going to not make us look so good this year. Yeah. Oh, what Cornell Dining told me was it is, it is taking a giant bite out of their, their budget. Yeah. The, the landfill waste from, from the dining halls is dreadful. It's, it's not a good thing, but um, I am on the drought committee, I'm on two of the drought committees, and I was the first one to say, you know, as sometimes you have to make a choice, and this is one of those times. The drought is quite serious. Is it still, are they still doing that? Yes. Or, oh, they are. They're, yes. they're still doing it. We're hoping, we're, we're hoping things are going to get better, but I have a three o'clock on that, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
but if things don't improve, what it is doing is it is having a, helping us keep we drop water consumption on campus about 20 percent, and right now we're having to to balance better to be there. I, I think Lori also wanted to remind everybody that Tompkins County. Tompkins County Recycle and Waste will help you dispose of most everything and put it in the appropriate place. And most of it is free, right? I mean, uh, unless you have huge amounts. Or if you have freezers or things like that, they charge you a, 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 a fee for that. But if you have questions about home waste, Tompkins County Recycle is good. Are, are the compostable forks and spoons and stuff more expensive than what the alternatives would be, and if we're not composting that, why do we buy them? Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know what the answer is. I can answer that. Um, for Canvas, uh, the costs are about the same. Our procurement group over the years has been able to contract a very good price for that. Um, if you're seeing them, a lot of what you're seeing are ones that people still have. Um, the new compost change went into effect last month. Um, so there's still a lot of material out there that simply hasn't been used up yet. Um, so there will be different kinds of forks and knives. We'll go back to plastic instead of compostable. One thing you'll notice, though, is it's really hard to tell the difference between the two. Um, and so, which is a part of the problem, um, is that it's hard to tell the difference. But um, Cornell Dining started last December in certain dining halls, seeing what the difference is. Because in post-consumer, we're Customers are sorting stuff after the use. Almost 50% of the compost we've had been rejected. Um, so the hope is that by having this, the stream be consistent, um, we'll actually hopefully be able to actually capture more compost than the one we've rejected so much. And then it's also it's also easier for departments, you know, if they're having an event, to try to change the rules depending on if they have keep the compost come in or not. It was just getting Untenable. Yeah. We've got a question here and then one there. So is the idea with the food only to mainly negate all of that stuff that is like claims biodegradable? And is that a labeling issue due to policy making or does it actually like why can they label it as biodegradable? So, <laughs> so why they can label it as biodegradable is because it, it breaks down over X many years. And okay. there's I don't think great national standards on that. Okay. So, um, but compostable is, is a little different because it's different chemically okay. for, for the ground. Um, the big challenge as, as far as why you go to food scraps and, and napkins only are two things. One is those compostable plastics don't break down very quickly. Um, and the other piece is total contamination. So if you go out to Cornell Compost Facility, they've always kept the dining compost separate because they can't use it except on their own fields because there's little forks and knives and Pepsi bottles sticking out of it all over the place. So you can't put it under the tulips and they haul it just. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so there's that. Um, but the other thing is, and you guys let me know if this isn't right because this is something I've heard but I've never actually seen documentation on it, um, which is that the compostable plastics often has more methane than regular plastics when they break down. So what happens is also with um, campus using all sorts of composable plastics all over, you're only capturing what people properly use in the dining hall, which means as soon as they walk out and they go all over campus, they're putting it in recycling. And then we're contaminating the recycling bins because composable plastics aren't recyclable. Yeah. And then we're all, so that material's ending up in the landfill and it's just doing more, more harm than good. Gotcha. Um, doesn't help the recycling industry at all if we're just contaminating We've got another question. The, exactly. Great. Lead into my question. Um, so recycling, it's all, I know like compost, you can contaminate it, and if you contaminate it, you send it to the landfill. Is that the same with recycling? No. No. So if you... Recycling gets hand sorted down in Tompkins County, which is why for anyone here working labs very often, labs or clinical spaces. So we've had to work really hard in labs where people tr want to do the right thing and then say, oh, this needle's metal, it'll recycle. Um, and it's like, A, that's against the law, but B, um, you know, people are hand sorting this material. So we don't want people being exposed to whatever goes on in the labs. Okay. Um, I'll just leave it at that. So, so, so uh, compost, however, there's no sorting process. 
Uh, for us on campus, it gets hand sorted at Tompkins County. Anything that, uh, and they capture the high value materials, the high value plastics, and the high value paper. Okay, and they sell it. That's part of how the county funds the recycling program. What they don't gets mixed in with our residential recycling, which goes to Ontario County. Oh, it's Ontario. Ontario County. County. Sorry. It's okay. We don't use Seneca Meadows. We use Ontario. County. That was one of my questions. We have a gripe against Seneca Meadows. They're they're not so great. But, um, <laughs> The, and then it gets sorted again, where there's people, but then there's also magnets and lasers and all this cool stuff that does better. Um, at that. Is that national? Like, is that everywhere? So no, like rock. Gets, recycling gets hand sorted, or is that? In general, it's always hand sorted, one okay. way or the other. Um, we are actually really, really lucky that we have um, both a wonderful county and we have a really, really good vendor. Um, if you go to Tioga County, which is 20 yeah. miles. South, they don't. Their programs are different, so you have a great amount of inconsistency, not just state by state, but county by county. Yes. Yeah, also, I don't know if you're aware of that, but Vendable is actually just sorting through the compost every day to get out the compost and the knives. The Vendable's yes. owner, um, I'm forgetting her name. Um, she's wonderful, and she pays her employees to hand sort the compost, right? The compost because people, to hand sort everything, right? To make sure that what she sends out of there is, you know, properly you know, sorted, right? Which is, she's paying a lot, you know, to do that. Yeah. Do, do you think the Western managing, managing things, such as the uh, center center, the corner is better than other places? Uh, what's, what's a, advantages and the disadvantages in community. I mean, why do we do a better job? Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering to if, if, if we do a better job in we, we compare. We do. Compare with other if you compare, so we have some, there's some other colleges out there that do better than we do. I, straight up. You know, they're out there. Rutgers is phenomenal, you know. Um, and different ones do better for different reasons. Um, it very much relies on the community. We very much rely on our community and our vendors. Um, so, so first off, Tompkins County is, is amazing. Um, and uh, their director is Barb Ekstrom. Who Cornell is, graduate. Who, yeah, she's a Cornell graduate, and it has been her passion in life. She, she's been working on this since the 80s um, and has programs where, as a resident, I pay for trash, but my recycling is free. Um, and they also have put laws in place to require um, companies to do that. It's great. So we're really lucky that way. Um, but we also have a sustainability <coughs> initiative for a land grant institution. Um, we have a lot of um, commitment as, a, as an institution to do the right thing and, and use the campus as a, as a living lab. And that is fantastic as, as someone who's a part of this place because we have uh, buy-in and, and support team members from departments all over campus, and that helps us. Okay. We're going to have to call time. Can I just make one comment? Yes. So this had to do with the, the biking, walking thing at the end. I went to a, a thing yesterday where they opened the Black Diamond Trail, and the guy from Tompkins County said within five years we will have 51 miles of biking trail in Tompkins County. So pretty amazing. Yeah. So it goes along with what you were saying about the county. Yeah. Just so you know, about a third of staff drive to campus alone. Others, otherwise, and about 90% of students uh, commute by bike or walking. So, in that way, I think we may be the best in the country. In the country. So, thank you very much to presenters and to visiting guests. This was really fascinating, and I encourage you to recycle and repurpose these discussions outside so we can get ready for the next occupant of the road. But uh, thanks very much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.